Um, so I'll do a quick, uh, a quick introduction. Once again, for those who just arrived, I'm Mike Montgomery with Cal Innovates. Uh, we are uh, sponsoring this uh, symposium along with the Stanford Journal of International Law, and we're very, very happy to be here. Um, we have um, Paul Rosenzweig, who's going to be leading this panel. Um, and uh, um, this is Paul. He'll be speaking um, quite a bit and tweeting at the same time. So by the way, if you have questions that you want uh, the panel to address, tweet them in. Um, you can see uh, uh, Paul's handle uh, right there on the screen. Um, let's see, next up is Irving Laco. Did I get that wrong? Yep. Did I? Lacho. Lacho. Jesus, I, I promised you I'd get it right. Uh, he's the director for the Center for a New American, uh, for New American Security. Uh, Mark Rogers uh, is the principal security researcher for Lookout, uh, which is the uh, um, world's number one mobile security uh, firm, and um, he has a very interesting background. Hopefully, he'll share some of that with you. Um, and then John Smith uh, is the uh, chief privacy counsel for Raytheon, um, and um, he has uh, um, been hiding his Twitter handle from us, which is okay. Um, I would, uh, I would um, ask everybody to try to find him online, and he's done a very good job of uh, keeping a very low profile. So maybe we have a lot to learn from John Smith, and that is his real name. <laughs> he told me that, yes, yes. So anyway, um, let's, uh, let's get started and uh, have at it, Paul. Well, great. Um, we've got uh, 75 minutes uh, for this panel. And what we're going to do in this panel is kind of change the top, the focus slightly. Uh, I think it's fair to say the last panel was at a pretty high level of, of generality with a lot of overview in it. And, and in this one, we're going to dive down into a particular set of issues. Um, I was asked to, to, to do some scene setting, and then each of my colleagues is going to give some remarks as well, and then we'll turn quickly to questions. Uh, what we're going to talk about here is what, uh, what your... Uh, uh, agenda called cyber vigilantism, which is, of course, a, a loaded and fraught way of talking about the topic, um, since vigilantism is always bad in all circumstances, as we all know. Um, but it is, uh, it is a good way of thinking about the topic of private sector self-help, um, private sector hackback, uh, private sector active defenses, however you might want to talk about it. In other words, situations in which private sector actors, non-governmental actors, so we're, we're going to be completely talking about the people in this room and the people in, in Silicon Valley and what they do, not about what they do in Washington, what they might do in response to uh, malicious assaults on their own systems, right? Now, this has become, uh, yeah, Mark was saying before the, the thing, that before the uh, outside, that this has been on people's minds for a number of years, a dozen years or so, but it's come to the forefront a lot more lately. Uh, and the discussion in, in Washington and in much of the United States has focused exclusively, almost exclusively, on uh, domestic law. That is, whether or not a private sector actor like IBM, uh, acting in its own self-defense, uh, would be violating American domestic law. That's a great topic, and it's not the one we're going to talk about today. Because uh, this is, we're being sponsored by the Journal of International Law here at Stanford. And so, consistent with that, we're going to try and spend as much of our time talking about um, international aspects of this. Um, and so, I'm going to kind of start by uh, s just provisional definitions. And for the technologists out there, I know this is wrong, but we're going to try and do it anyway, uh, just to, because lawyers have to talk in categories. I want to break the field of self defense down into two types of actions. You know, uh, internal self-defense, inherent self-defense, kind of monitoring your own networks, and then more active measures where you go outside of your network and do something on somebody else's network or to somebody else through any one of a dozen technological means that perhaps Mark will tell us more about the, the actual possibilities. But that's the, that's the dichotomy, that uh, the technological dichotomy I want to deal with. And if you ask me what the international, international law says about that, the answer as a first cut is nothing, right? But that's kind of boring, and you know, it doesn't make for a good talk or discussion here. But there are no conventions in uh, that, that cover this in international law. And in general, international law doesn't focus on individuals or private actors. It's about state obligations. 
You know, the Budapest Convention we were talking about does not make it a crime uh, to, to hack a computer. It obliges all of the signatory states to make domestic criminal law about computer hacking. So, it, so individuals are generally immune from international law. But again, I don't want to be dull. Um, so I thought I'd, I'd, I'd talk about a couple of things that, are rel that you might tease out from existing international law that are sort of relevant to this topic. The first is the Budapest Convention, uh, which says that states must make it a crime to hack into a computer. And the words they use are uh, without right, which was the international law construction of a way of trying to import into the idea that there might be some rightful authorized instances of access to a computer. So the idea here was without right, and the explanatory notes to the convention actually interestingly say that that reflects the insight that conduct described is not always punishable per se, but it may be legal and justified not only in cases of classical legal defenses like consent or self-defense or necessity, but in where other principles apply. So one of the things we can see is that at a meta level, international law does recognize, uh, even in the cyber domain, that self-defense is an acceptable principle. How that works its way out, difficult to say. So can we look anywhere in international law to see if there is anything where self-defense principles have uh, been developed more fully than this one single mention in, in the computer area, cyber area? Turns out we can. And the, the best and closest analogy is a very old doctrine, the law of piracy, right? You have boats used to travel the high seas and Pirates would attack them and try and steal their goods and wares. And, and uh, you know, sounds a little bit like a cyber attack on the information superhighway or the information sea or the information ocean. Um, and it turns out there's really some interesting uh, doctrine that you can get out of that. It has long been the law that masters of vessels under attack uh, on the open ocean may exercise and use even lethal force in self-defense of their vessel. Right? In other words, you can shoot people to protect property, which is a kind of rare, um, rare set of doctrines here. Uh, today, uh, if you're interested, it's actually characterized in a Coast Guard guidance to masters of vessels, which authorizes the vessel master to protect his vessel cargo from theft or damage on the high seas. And so if we take that as our cyber model, we could say you know, that private sector companies might be authorized to use force, even lethal force, in self-defense, the cyber equivalent of lethal force. But of course it doesn't end there because there was another piece of the piracy puzzle. It's called the doctrine of hot, hot pursuit. It's the idea that once uh, you've beaten off the pirate and he's running away, can you follow him? Can you chase back after him and uh, be what would be the equivalent of the second side of my cyber doctrine, active measures? And the answer is that private sector actors were not privileged, are not privileged. Uh, to engage in hot pursuit. That is reserved for vessels on government service. So it's essentially a governmental function. The U.S. Navy can do hot pursuit. The U.S. Coast Guard can do hot pursuit. But the master of the uh, SS Maersk, after beating off the attack, can't put his guys in a, in a boat and send them out after the pirates off Somalia. It's not allowed in the international law. And if we follow that doctrine here into cyberspace, we might say that there's international law limits of, uh, of hot per the cyber equivalent of hot pursuit. Um, now, that begs a couple of questions. The first, of course, is whether or not there's any, I mean, piracy law has been around for 100 years, 200 years, 300 years, right? Has a well-developed, settled set of doctrines. <clears throat> it's doubtful that currently there is any real international norm about cyber piracy and cyber hacking in the first instance. And the second is that even assuming we could translate this piracy history to the cyber piracy situation, the cyber hacking situation, um, does that mean that we're going to have to limit ourselves to state actors or are we going to maybe discard that historical model and say that private sector actors uh, could be allowed to act? There are lots of policy reasons why we might not do that, but here I just want to talk about the law. And then I'll end my talk uh, the brief introduction here, though there's much more to say about this, with one other reflection on international law, which is that international law is created in two ways. One way, the way that Dr. Touré was talking to us about last night, is through affirmative creation of law but through treaty and negotiations between sovereign nations. 
And the other is through the development of customary international law, whereas the national state practices develop over time, uh, kind of organically, what we would think of as common law, in a way. Uh, and if there is a common law of hackback, private sector uh, self-help developing, it's probably against the practice. You know, many states in, uh, around the globe have laws that make it, that are much clearer than American law that against hackback of any sort or, or practice. For example, the German uh, criminal code has a hacker paragraph, which if you haven't read, uh, is pretty stringent in all of its limitations. And that leads me to my final point, which is that cyber is inherently an international domain, right? It is 100% certain, 100% certain that any American company attempting to exercise active self-defenses anywhere off of its own network, anywhere off of the servers that are actually in Raytheon's hands in Dallas, um, is going to be affecting servers somewhere outside of the United States, right? Possibly in Germany. Uh, uh, almost certainly, uh, uh, if you were Mandiant, in China, right? And guaranteed, some of those states, including China, which also has a very stringent anti-hacking law on its books, um, the action of American actors going overseas will be a violation of the domestic law of that country overseas. Now, in the case of ha Chinese hackers or Nigerian hackers coming to the United States, they don't care because they understand that they're pretty much beyond extradition and not subject to, the, to our ability to get them and bring them here and prosecute them. But American companies going overseas who also have multinational overseas presence um, are very likely to be subject to some form of civil or criminal sanction as they act overseas precisely because they have assets, personnel, uh, property in, uh, in those countries, much as Google is now having to uh, conform to European privacy concerns precisely because they want to act over in Europe. So my cautionary note to those of you who are actually private sector actors here in the United States uh, and on this I'll conclude, is that it is not just uh, American domestic law that you need to worry about and whether or not the Computer Fraud Abuse Act criminalizes your behavior, um, which, uh, which is, I think, an ambiguity, but you need to consider whether or not in acting overseas you are, A, violating the international laws of pi piracy, uh, and B, whether or not you're violating Germany's hacker paragraph. Uh, so that's my kind of scene-setting introduction, a little longer than Howard's, but what the heck. Irv, up to you. Okay. Thank you, Paul. So Paul asked me to talk about um, how the Tallinn Manual applies to this, this question of uh, cyber vigilantism. And after much consideration and discussion with the authors of the Tallinn Manual, I've determined that it doesn't. So James, <laughs> I'd like to thank you for inviting me out here. And <laughs> dinner last night was great. So. <laughs> Um, so uh, it really doesn't, but, uh, <laughs> but I want to talk about potentially how it could. Uh, so let me, let me try to weave that story together. Um, and let me start off by talking about what the Tallinn Manual is. So the Tallinn Manual is, it's really an academic paper, uh, and it's, it's actually been attributed as being a NATO document. It's actually not an official NATO document. Um, it was coordinated by the NATO uh, Cyber Defense Center of Excellence in Tallinn, Estonia, which is how it got its name. But it's basically a group of 20 lawyers who spent three years putting together this academic study, and its focus is on applying the law of armed conflict to cyberspace. So to use a couple of legal terms I don't really understand, it looks at um, uh, use in bello and uh, use ad bellum. So use of force and armed aggression uh, in cyberspace. So basically, uh, things that might lead to um, violations of Article 2.4 and Article 51 of the, of the UN Treaty. Um, so those uh, articles do not apply to cybercrime, cyber espionage, and a lot of the things that, that we're talking about here. Uh, and in fact, the, the, uh, the, the manual makes clear, and, and the authors of the manual make clear, that uh, you, you cannot really apply a lot of those principles uh, to things like economic activity. So use of force is really focused on military activity. So for example, if uh, states are causing each other economic harm through trade or even through, say, environmental damage like acid rain, uh, when you try to deal with that problem, you don't go to these uh, law of armed conflict 
uh, aspects of the law, you go to other aspects. So, so the Tom Manual does not apply in its current version. Now I will tell you that they're gonna do a version 2.0 that will address the issues here, and when they do, they're gonna have to look at things like intellectual property law, telecommunications law, human rights law, uh, and some of the laws that, that, that Paul mentioned. So eventually, I think they're gonna try to apply those principles to, to what we're talking about here. So given that this is really focused on the law of armed conflict, what, what can we learn? And uh, to answer that question, I'm gonna step back for just a moment and talk about um, US government policy. And in particular, I need to talk about comments that uh, Michael Daniel, the uh, cyber coordinator uh, at the White House, uh, some comments that he made um, at Georgetown uh, on Wednesday at a conference. And he talked about the fact that we are in a new era, and this new era is defined by the kinds of things we've talked about this morning, cyber crime, cyber espionage, denial of service attacks against, against companies. So, you know, he laid out this sort of threat picture, uh, and he, he basically said the U.S. government's policy is that, is that companies and organizations are mostly on their own in dealing with this threat. Now, there are things the government will do. Uh, in the right circumstance, the government will certainly intervene and try to help these uh, organizations. Uh, it may try to find out who's responsible and arrest them. Um, it may provide information through information sharing mechanisms. Uh, if you look at the executive order, there's a number of things in there the government says it's gonna do to help these companies, such as develop a framework of standards and best practices. Um, and then of course, there's sort of classic things the government can do to try to deal with this problem, like diplomacy and economic sanctions and the like. So uh, there are a number of things the government can do, but basically, if you're an individual or a company, in terms of day-to-day -day, uh, responses to the threats we face, basically, you're on your own. So, um, given that, there's this question of, okay, under what circumstances will the government intervene or should it intervene? Because there are cases uh, where, uh, you know, if there's state-sponsored activity against a major U.S. company where the U.S. government has intervened and probably will continue to do so. Um, so, you could ask, well, what are the circumstances under which the U.S. government will actually take action? That's a question. Another question is, uh, what can U.S. companies do in response? And uh, this goes to Paul's question of, you know, things like uh, self-defense, hot pursuit. Uh, there may be a difference depending on the specific circumstances of, of what a company may or may not be able to, to do legally in response. Um, and finally, there's the question of what companies can do to actually work with the government or help the government respond to the circumstance uh, in question. And so when it comes to answering those questions, and right now we don't have answers to any of them, that's where I think the Tallinn Manual can help. Uh, and in particular, uh, the place where it's most useful is there are a, a set of criteria that were laid out in the Tallinn Manual. They were developed by Mike Schmidt, who is now a chair of the law department at the Naval War College. And he developed something a few years ago that we call the Schmidt Analysis. They modified that slightly for this document. And what, what he did was he laid out a set of criteria Questions you need to answer in order to determine if a cyber incident crosses the threshold into a use of force. So they're applying these criteria to the law of armed conflict. But I think we can apply some of the same criteria to the questions that we're talking about here with cyber vigilantism and active, uh, active cyber defense. So for example, uh, if, just to list off some of the criteria that need to be considered, severity, right? how serious is the incident, immediacy, how quickly do the effects actually take place, uh, directness, so is, how direct is the, is the incident, you know, the, how directly is the attacker affecting the victim? Uh, invasiveness, so you know, basically how, how deep is the penetration going into the target system or the target network? Um, and then there's some other things that are sort of focused on the law, military domain that are not as relevant, such as uh, military effectiveness. So those criteria aren't as, aren't as useful, but there's a couple others that I think uh, are, are very uh, important, such as who's attacking you. That's very important when you're looking at uh, law of armed conflict. It's also obviously very important for us here, so trying to understand who's attacking you. And not just that, but what's their pattern of activity? Is this a one-time event? Is this something you're seeing over and over again? Um, and these are things that are very important in looking at active cyber defense. And so if you look at the Mandiant report, for example, um, one of the things that makes it a powerful report is they've been tracking this activity over a period of many years. And you start to develop uh, basically strategic intelligence on who's behind this, what their tools and techniques are, and doing that allows you to uh, take more effective measures in response. So 
these criteria are actually criteria that could be used to answer a number of questions. When should the U.S. government respond? Well, if you have this list of questions and you can answer them effectively, uh, that might allow the U.S. government to determine when they need to intervene. It might also give companies some leeway in terms of uh, how far they can go. So if they're going to make a legal argument that they have a right to take certain actions to defend themselves, it may make a big difference if uh, they're being attacked by a nation state, for example, as opposed to uh, an individual hacker, whether uh, the, the attack is immediate, whether it's direct, whether it's extremely invasive, um, you know, that sort of thing. So these things are, are very, very important. And finally, I think potentially the most important one is this question of uh, intelligence gathering because um, companies can actually do some very interesting things to gather information rather than hack back or do damage. Uh, those things may or may not be legal, depending on your interpretation. But what's interesting is these companies can provide that information to the government to help the government do its job in terms of either uh, counterintelligence, law enforcement, or whatever measures the government feels are appropriate. And getting that information is something that's actually listed here as criteria that are, that are useful in the Tallinn Manual. So I do think there's some applicability here, and um, I look forward to seeing where they take this in the next iteration. So thank you very much. Thanks, sir. So, so you're sensing a pattern here. The question is, what does international law have to say to, to Silicon Valley? And the answer is, eh, we're working on it. But it will happen more as the future comes along. So don't worry, Jim. The, the thesis of the, of the conference was a good one. <laughs> Mark? OK. So the, the interesting part of my background that was alluded to earlier is I've been the director of security operations for DEF CON for about 15 years. And for those of you who aren't familiar, DEF CON is the world's largest hackers conference. So being in DEF CON, we, we have an interesting perspective on things. And we've seen certain conversations go around and come back around again and come back around again. And, and this is one of them. A active defense is not new. It's been going on for decades. I remember back in the 90s when I was uh, an admin for a large ISP in Europe setting up what we called a tar pitting defense to stop spammers. And the concept of tar pitting was the spammers have millions of emails to dump. They want to dump them quickly. They've got a finite amount of resources. And so you set up your system to hold on to their resources, to keep the connections alive as long as possible, and waste their resources. That slowed them down enough to, to basically break their operations. But the problem with active defenses is, as good as the active defenders are, the attackers are equally good. And their techniques evolve. I would say that the use of botnets for spamming is probably attrib attributable to tar pitting because they got ah. to the point where they didn't want to waste their resources, so instead they wasted somebody else's resources. And there are other aspects as well, things like the, the RBL, um, real-time uh, blacklists and, and relay blocking that people put in place to stop spamming um, uh, mail servers from sending out mail. But it evolves. If we take a look at um, botnets, there's been a very effective, and I would say, quite legal method up until now of taking down botnets. Traditionally, a botnet has to have a command and control server. That command and control server has to be able to talk to, the, uh, talk to its clients. The clients have to be able to talk to it. So the simple approach that everyone used for a few years now is find the domains that the uh, CNC is using and get them pulled down. If you get them pulled down, you effectively cut the heads off the Hydra. And at that point, the botnet's dead. Well, the people are still infected, but there's no inf information going out, and it's unable to be used. The attackers have already evolved, and now we're looking at things like P2P botnets. Botnets where if you cut off a single head, you're not going to stop it. The techniques that people are using to try and bring those botnets down, the new sink holding techniques, are right on the edge of, of safety and legality. The new techniques are you find the malware that was used, you modify the malware, you use that to take control of part of the botnet yourself, and then you extend your control of the botnet, gradually con taking control of it and squeezing out the attackers. This is what happened with the Kelios botnet recently, um, joint operation with Microsoft, Kaspersky, and CrowdStrike. The problem with that is what do you do once you're in control of a botnet 
of several hundred thousand infected PCs. What do you do with all the PII that you're now sitting on? What's your obligation to inform the owners of the machines, your obligation to inform credit card companies, banks? It's a big, big stinking mess, to be honest. Um, and I, I don't think there's any clear answer, but there are effective approaches. I think, honestly, the international community has to work together to deal with it. The other issues with uh, active attacks are how do you identify honestly who the actor is? A lot of the assumptions that people make about this APT is China, there's a lot of guesswork involved. I mean, the management report was actually pretty good, but it was built up over a long period of time. In the moment, as a company, when you're facing an attack that's threatening your critical resources, whether it's a denial of service attack or there's an intruder who's breaking into your system, who's going after your data, you don't have the time to build up that accurate a profile. And with people's ability to tunnel through networks like Tor, which is a cloud routing network that effectively allows you to disguise your original address by routing it through a number of different nodes, or through botnets, or through just even chain relays, the ability to identify who is actually involved is very difficult. The only ones you're gonna catch, honestly, quickly, are the careless ones. And as people push harder, the careless ones are gonna become less common because they're going to evolve. Because in order to do their business, in order to make their money, they have to avoid getting caught. It's kind of Darwinism in action. The other question with the, the practicalities of this is, companies really have to ask what their aim is in doing this. Are you trying to stop a denial of service that's bringing your systems down? Are you trying to retrieve data? Are you trying to destroy data that somebody may have stolen? Or are you simply taking revenge? And out of all those questions, probably the only one that is easy to answer with an active defense is the denial of service. Because the denial of service, it's very feasible to go to the ISPs that are involved and have uh, internet routes black holed and have the traffic sink hold. But even still, we see today denial of a service attacks in the magnitude of 300 gigabytes a second that take days for people to stop. And that's largely because the international community doesn't cooperate very well in dealing with some of these things. And there are plenty of ISPs who, on the word of an organization, aren't prepared to take down an address on their network. And maybe in some, some regards you can kind of sympathize with them. Can you just switch off part of your network to paying customers? Where does that leave you contractually? It's, it's a very, very complicated uh, scenario. The other scenarios of going after somebody who's stolen your data and getting it back, well, it's pretty clear. You are effectively breaking somebody's law. You're gonna be breaking a law at the end point. You may even be breaking laws domestically. And the chance of success, I'm skeptical, to be honest, because any attacker who's worth their salt will steal data and will put data onto media. And once it's onto media, the only way you're gonna get it is by physically entering their premise and seizing it. That's not in the realms of possibility for most companies. It's, I think there's a, a, a lot of smoke being blown about some of this. So, I mean, the question is really where to go next. The hacker community has discussed this for, for a long time. And the answer that came out and has kind of circulated is, do what you think's best. Operate within the bounds of the organization that you're in, but try to adhere to some morality. The company I work for, Lookout, we routinely take down botnets. We do it through the legal method of reporting to ISPs, going through to organizations to say, look, you've got a CNC on your network. We see the following traffic coming through. And in the case of mobile malware, that's pretty effective. But I can see a day when that's gonna evolve as well. And honestly, I think there needs to be some kind of legal framework and cooperation internationally if we want to actually have any control of this. That's great. See, more international law, Jim. We're still hitting on all cylinders, John. 
Great. <clears throat> thank you, Paul. It's an honor to be with you uh, today. I want to thank the organizers uh, for the invitation and for all of the effort in putting together this wonderful uh, conference. It's been really good dialogue uh, and uh, in this panel and the previous one. Uh, I do want to say that I am not here uh, representing Raytheon Company. Uh, uh, I'm here as a lawyer who has been in government and in the private sector uh, dealing uh, in the cyber uh, area. Um, I can empathize with uh, Howard Schmidt's conversation at the Stanford Guest House. I had a similar conversation and had a similar reaction when I was asked for personal data. Um, although I will say that when your name is John Smith, you expect to have conversations with hotel receptionists. And those conversations can be longer and they include uh, topics relevant here like strong authentication and disambiguation and trusted identities. So uh, good preparation for cyber. Um, let me, I was asked to focus on the constraints that uh, U.S. companies and U.S. multinational companies, since this is an international conference, uh, can face uh, in trying to deal with cyber threats and to try to offer uh, some ideas as to what parts of the solution might be. I don't think there's uh, anyone seriously arguing that there's one, there's a silver bullet uh, for the challenges we've been discussing. Um, the goals of the bad guys in cyberspace are uh, similar to the goals of bad guys through centuries. Um, cyberspace, however, of course, has given them new powers, which we've been talking about. And uh, other speakers have already talked about uh, reasons why cyberspace challenges the traditional legal categories and analysis that we're used to in uh, trying to address bad guy behavior. Let me focus on uh, just one or elaborate. Uh, Paul mentioned in the previous panel about how this is a different defensive space, and I agree with that. Um, one thing that results from the universal connectivity of uh, everyone plugged into the network, internet, et cetera, our panelists, uh, I see many of you being plugged in, is the consequence of that is it's now easy for the bad guys to inflict personalized, even customized if they want to direct harm to individuals, right? Individual private companies and persons, you and me, uh, who may be just minding our own business. Um, since cyber Jedis were invoked uh, already, uh, I'll uh, extend the Star Wars analogy. Given the paucity of cyber law, uh, as part of my scholarly preparation for my remarks, I watched Star Wars again. And um, I remember, uh, as a youth uh, watching Star Wars, thinking it was highly improbable that a force as powerful as the Empire would design a Death Star that then had this one vulnerability that uh, could be exploited by rebels with uh, a rudimentary starfighter that could blow up the whole Death Star. Somehow, as a youth, I was willing to suspend my disbelief about everything else in Star Wars, but that, focus, that focused my attention. Now that cyberspace has emerged and we see the vulnerabilities we have, I get it, right? The internet uh, was not designed to do what it's doing today, right? It, it, because of the convenience and power and affordability of, of what cyberspace offers, we join. It works. To, to get back to Howard's uh, question in the first panel, right? <laughs> it works so well, we join more of it. We put more of our operations on it, but it was never designed to, to bear the load, and certainly not with the security precautions uh, that would be necessary to offer, operate safely in cyberspace. Um, so uh, cyberspace lacks governance, and the first two <laughs> panelists <laughs> gave us some sense of uh, how lacking that governance is. Um, it lacks the authority of law, right? Who is authorized to make the laws, uh, the rules that apply to cyberspace? It lacks the power of law. Who can enforce those rules? And it lacks a lot of substance uh, of law. Uh, what are the rules that apply 
uh, in cyberspace. Uh, two characteristics of them are the laws are very uncertain. Um, how do statutes in the U.S. Uh, will uh, focus first? Uh, how do how do pre-internet statutes, many of which were passed in the telephonic era, how do they apply uh, to cyberspace? There is almost no case law, if we look to the courts, almost no case law that's on point uh, in, in the cyber domain as to how those statutes apply. So in addition to uh, uncertainty, very slow, right? Law is inherently, especially in our common law uh, system, based on precedent um, and uh, can be very disconnected. It is very disconnected right now from the rapid technological change that defines cyberspace, and presumably that will continue to be the case. Um, in the relevant private sector federal statutes, there have been no, there's been no significant change in two decades, roughly. <laughs> Imagine where we were, where the internet was, where computer networks were two decades ago, right? No major change, except you might say FISA and the Patriot Act, but that affects government's abilities to respond, right? Uh, not so much private actors. Uh, and the Supreme Court of the United States uh, has had two opportunities in major privacy ca cases in, in the last few years to uh, make some definite rule to try to define what, it, what a reasonable expectation of privacy means in the digital era. And they have declined to do so, I think quite wisely, to, to let, perhaps to see what innovation and, and development will do. And uh, perhaps that will uh, shape the answer for us as things progress. So I want to talk about two legal constraints and then talk about uh, what might lift those constraints and then talk about an additional aspect of a partial solution. So first legal constraint on private actors, and here again um, focusing particularly on U.S based multinational companies. Uh, first constraint is the privacy right of individuals. I'm not saying privacy is a bad thing. I'm Raytheon's privacy lawyer. I think privacy is an excellent thing. Uh, uh, but it's a value that must be balanced uh, with other values. And uh, uh, I do not think that appropriate privacy and cybersecurity are in, uh, incompatible. Um, but cybersecurity, one basic element is that it must monitor network traffic, right? If you can't see what's going on, you very well can't do anything about it. And network traffic translates into the individual activities of individual human beings who have legal rights in their information privacy. And if you go to other countries, especially in the European Union, those information rights increase. Um, so, uh, Let's take what would seem to be an easy case, right? A U.S. company, private company, monitoring U.S. U users on that company's own U.S. networks. That monitoring okay uh, of employees. Well, a dozen different U.S. states uh, have telephonic era laws that require all party consent to communications before they can be intercepted, et cetera, monitored. How would all party consent even work in the email concept, right? in the email context? Uh, California is one of those states that uh, requires all party consent. Um, if you're a multinational company, then that uncertainty uh, is compounded by the complexity of all the countries in which you're located. Uh, employee monitoring is particularly difficult in certain European countries. Uh, in one, for example, if you allow your employee any personal use of a company asset like a computer, then there's a strong argument that uh, the employer monitoring uh, the activity of that employee on that computer can be criminal. Uh, so multinational companies have to struggle for the privilege of even just watching the bad guys come in and steal your intellectual property and take it out the door. So what could remove this constraint? Um, in the U.S., uh, an express federal preemption, possibly by an amendment to ECPA, Electronic Privacy Communications Act, of state privacy laws would probably do the trick in terms of the consent requirement. Um, allow one party consent like ECPA does um, in to, as a point of comparison. This is realistic uh, in the uh, 
uh, cyber legislation that got close last year, right? There was a federal preemption of state, uh, 46 different state data breach uh, notification and uh, rules, which would have been uh, preempted by one federal uh, rule. Legislation didn't pass, as many of you know, but it's possible that it could work again. Uh, outside the United States, uh, to remove that constraint, you would need to change privacy laws to enable cybersecurity monitoring, robust cybersecurity monitoring, uh, even of, of your own networks in a number of countries. Uh, what's the prospects for that? Uh, some of you may be familiar with the European Union's current uh, very active discussion about uh, changing its privacy regime. And most of those changes would uh, are pro-privacy, right? Uh, and uh, I, my assessment is that that discussion is hostile to the idea of uh, increasing the ability of, of monitoring by employers uh, of their own networks and their own employees. The EU just came out with a cyber strategy, and I read it, and it's uh, quite general. I don't see the type of fix I'm talking about uh, being a focus. Um, it's hard to tell from the generality of some of the language, but I certainly didn't see anything specific indicating a, a determination to do something to make it easier for employers to, to monitor their own networks and the cause of cybersecurity. So uh, that's legal constraint number one. How about legal constraint number two? And uh, my fellow panelists have already alluded to this, uh, that U.S. cyber defenders essentially have to stay home um, inside their own networks. A common understanding of U.S. law is that if, there, if there's any activity, you can do anything you want on your own network, but virtually nothing on someone else's network without proper authorization. And if you're in an adversarial relationship, they're not going to authorize you, right? Um, and the statute, I think, Paul, you mentioned it, uh, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act from the 1980s, right? Um, I, I thought it might be useful, since uh, you may not have a copy of the CCFA on your, right on your desk for easy access, like I do, um, to just read this very short sen uh, segment of the statute so you have a sense of exactly how broad it is. This is what U.S. multinational companies face. Whoever intentionally accesses a computer without authorization or exceeds authorized access and thereby obtains information from any protected computer, and which is defined to be virtually every computer in the United States and even ones out, not, in, out, not within the United States but that affect uh, interstate commerce in the United States, from any protected computer shall be punished, end quote, by imprisonment or fine. Extremely broad language. Or both. <laughs> or both, right, thank you. Um, so what can con resolve that constraint? Uh, I, I, I would personally favor a change in the law so that defensive reconnaissance and, and a re defensive response by a company is clearly allowed. And the conservative type of defensive response, right, that, that uh, other panelists have alluded to. Uh, some sort. Um, so could you follow your own in the John Smith proposal, personal view only, right? Could you follow your own property once it was stolen? Yes. Could you repossess or destroy or encrypt your own stolen property once it left your network if you could find it? Probably. I'm still thinking through the implications of that. Uh, I think a number of us are. But I would say probably yes. Can you damage the bad guy's data or equipment once it's taken off your network? I would say no. I think that the, the consequences of uh, letting that happen would lead to a lot of poor quality decision making and uh, might even cause states to lose control of their foreign policy, right, um, if it got bad enough. Um, should companies that engage in this sort of self-help be responsible for the collateral damage that they may cause to innocents, right, botnets, right, uh, hijacked computers? I, I would say yes, right? Uh, companies need to be able to uh, take on the responsibility for, for what they do. Um, so, uh, and, and let me talk a little bit more of why I think reconnaissance, the ability for companies to conduct some sort of reconnaissance, and Irv, you mentioned this, um, a little bit beyond the frontier of their, of their own networks is important. We need to gain visibility into what's coming at us. We need to have some early warning. We need to have some room to maneuver. Again, all in a de defensive posture. Um, 
So I used to serve in the Army uh, as a reservist, and so I'll use an infantry analogy, right? Think of that very broad uh, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act statute as suppressive fire <laughs> uh, uh, for companies who are therefore have their heads down, uh, keeping in their foxholes, right? They can't come up, and, and they know something's hit them after it hits them on the head, right? Uh, they, if companies were allowed to come up, take a look around, see what's coming, right? Have a sense of uh, uh, what was on the way in, they might be able to uh, repel it better. They could also, uh, a, a much better situation, right, would to have, be able to have interlocking fields of fire, right? Different companies and different individual foxholes all coming up, seeing what's, what's, coming, what's coming along. Uh, even better if we could have aerial observation, right, spotters, um, co collaboration with companies that have uh, great visibility or, or even government tips. Um, so I love military history. And uh, I'll give you an, an example of, the, uh, of a glacis, right? If you like med medieval fortifications, right? Uh, before the bad guys get to your fort, you want to have a nice, smooth, inclined plane so you can keep firing at them for a long way while they're attacking you and keep firing at them a long way while they're trying to retreat. Uh, that, that's sort of an idea. Um, the analogy to air power has been used. Uh, Stuart Baker, who many of us know well, has been uh, saying that a very good analogy for cyber conflict is, is the rise of air power. I, th I think that's, uh, there's a lot of credence to that. Um, so how did the British win the Battle of Britain? Other than Raytheon's contri instrumental contributions to the development of radar. <laughs> um, so uh, that radar and the intelligence the British were able to gather as the German bombers were coming across friendly British territory and the the bombers had to go a long way to reach those cities, right? So there was, there was time to, room to maneuver, uh, ability to do reconnaissance, uh, ability to affect, um, uh, uh, to, to, to raise the defenses and uh, get the planes in the air. And it became a war of attrition, right? How many pilots and planes could each side afford to lose and keep going? So let me compare a few numbers. This is not uh, about the private sector particularly, but uh, I've heard, how many, China has been mentioned, how many cyber attackers, cyber warriors does China have? I don't know. One number I've heard is, is that they have a million, about a million. Um, if others have ideas, it'd be great uh, to hear what those are. Uh, U.S. Cyber Command recently uh, announced that they are going to massively increase uh, their personnel up to 5,000, right? recruits they're looking for. How do you like those odds? <laughs> All right? Um, there are creative interpretations to speak of uh, uh, raising the constraints on this, creative inter interpretations of forms of self-defense, defensive property doctrine that could justify a proportional response. Um, I've heard an analogy about, you know, uh, precedent in old English law for farmers who were remotely uh, situated no time to call for the sheriff when the bad guys arrive. You have property to defend. You, you're authorized to do extra things to protect your property. But I, I would think that many of those uh, legal uh, ideas are pretty controversial, um, at least in the discussion phase, and too risky for too many companies. Do I have a couple more minutes? Yeah. All right. So uh, part of the solution would be to learn to share very appropriate for the social media generation. Um, and the media can help by uh, exposing, I agree with Nicole's comments about the explosion of public discussion about this topic. Um, the best role, I think, for private actors in the cybersecurity solution is information sharing. Open, speedy sharing of threat indicators about the bad guys, right? There's a lot of focus on, well, companies uh, need, uh, should be talking about what happened to them, right? That, that is going to be only of marginal value to the next company. The information about the bad guys, I don't care about their privacy, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and sharing those threat indicators quickly with as many in the community as we can um, will hold us in good stead. Some sectors are already sharing well, uh, finance, power, defense sector. And what do I mean by an indicator? This could be simply a bad IP address or techniques 
What's not relevant, right, is the, mess the, the human content in the message. I think what most of you think about when we think about we want our privacy protected. What takes down computers? It's not human language, it's computer code, right? Um, and what's not relevant is who is attacking us or why uh, they are attacking us for purpose of sharing the threat, uh, this threat data. So the goal is to alert the population to make hacking too costly, your tar pitting idea, right? Um, each, sect, each actor only sees a piece of the puzzle. When we share, the, pu the picture gets uh, much bigger and much better. Um, and if the bad guys are uh, able to penetrate less, it will force them to customize their targeting, uh, which will raise the costs. So in a world where we still lack attribution and, and, that's, and, and, and to impose reliably in consequences on those who are doing bad things, I think that this sort of open and speedy sharing is the best option available. You can use, uh, I've heard uh, public health analogies used right, where th think of malware as bad germs that are contagious and the health of one uh, is affected by the health of the rest of the population. Success is uh, key, success is dependent upon early detection and fast, broad alerts. It's not a competitive or some zero game and actors make unequal contributions but the benefits are shared. Uh, think about, for example, weather data, right, that the federal government obtains and shares and it's commercially used. Um, uh, I've got small kids, they love animals, we go to the zoo. Uh, think about giraffes in a pack uh, grazing with zebras and wildebeests, right? The giraffes are gonna see the lion coming first. They take off, the zebras and wildebeests uh, get away in time as well. The giraffes are usually gonna be doing all the work. Doesn't matter, everybody benefits, right? The herd gets away. Um, and the focus of these sorts of sharing uh, activities has to be, like in public health, getting well and moving on. It cannot be fixated on attribution and punishment. <laughs> what CISOs want, they just want to make it stop, right? And have a number of ideas of what we could do to improve uh, information sharing, uh, but I think my time is drawing to a close. Um, and uh, so I will uh, just, um, uh, yeah. Um, there, there are things that could be done to improve sharing among private actors, things that could be done to improve sharing to the government by private actors, and things that could be done uh, f to improve sharing from the government to private actors to, uh, to strengthen our joint defenses. Thank you for your attention, and we look forward to your questions. Great. Well, thanks a lot, guys. That was really good. Um, before we get to uh, questions, and I have one, uh, I, I, a, an irrelevant aside, but one that is obviously relevant at this point, is that it was clear that the destruction of the Death Star was a conspiracy between Leia, Darth Vader, and Luke. They're all family. Um, <laughs> And obvious, and, and Darth was the only one to escape, right? So he knew that the attack was coming. And in fact, if you Google this, there's a wonderful YouTube uh, expose of this that decisively proves it was a conspiracy. So I just want you all to know that. This is a joke, guys, okay? Laugh, you can laugh. You can laugh, right? I'm not, I'm not really with the tinfoil, honestly. What? Oh, yes, George Lucas was, oh, yes. So, yeah, it says it's not tinfoil, guys, really. It's a joke, but it's a great Google thing. Go, go Google it and have fun, but watch it after the panel concludes. Um, so I, I, I want to I ask one question uh, for each of the panelists, and I'll, I'll probably start with Mark and then let John and Irv come in afterwards, which is this. Um, if we are possessed of the belief that some form of private sector self-help is going to come, um, because people are going to do it even if it is illegal and even if they run risks because they can't stand the loss of property and it's their own balance of risks. Um, uh, I, I, you said something, Mark, that, that struck me because I've been talking about it in a different kinds, which was you took down the botnets and it was Lookout, CrowdStrike, and who was the third one? Uh, actually, it was um, CrowdStrike, Kaspersky, and Microsoft. CrowdStrike, Kaspersky, and Microsoft. So three really sophisticated actors who are uh, uh, not likely to get it wrong by mistake. I mean, not likely to get it wrong on purpose and, and maybe we'll make mistakes, but we've got the error rate is low. The danger that a lot of people see in authorizing private sector self-help is that it's not always Microsoft, Kaspersky, and, and uh, CrowdStrike, which are, if you haven't heard of CrowdStrike, it's a 
it's, uh, it's a new company that's been formed by Sean Henry, who was the former head of the FBI's uh, cybersecurity uh, task force, and very sophisticated people as well. Um, but they're worried that it will be, um, you know, Mel's grocery store, right? And that Mel will accidentally start the first cyber war with China by going in and taking down the Beijing uh, electric grid. Um, so how do, we, how do we control for that? How do, we, uh, how do we assure ourselves, if we decide to go down this road at all, that the only people who do this are people who we think are qualified and aren't, and, and if you tell me we should allow self-selection to happen, then I say Mel will do it himself. So how do I make sure, how do I empower CrowdStrike and Microsoft and Kaspersky and, and, and whoever else and not empower Mel's grocery store? That's a difficult question. Um, I think no matter what you do, there is gonna be an element of self-selection because you're gonna have companies who have issues and they're gonna look within themselves for the per best person to deal with those issues. Maybe that's an external company that they've contracted to help them, maybe that's inside. I think the best thing to do is to set up more robust knowledge sharing and mo more robust cooperation so that these people know who they can turn to so that they know that actually in this difficult situation I can turn to these people, they're, they're, they're pretty good at dealing with this, they can help me. But th there are a couple of points, one in, in response to some of the stuff that John said that I, I wanted to say as well. Th this situation isn't as quite as clear cut as you think. Um, having spotters is a great idea, but cyber attacks are very, very difficult to spot. Mm -hmm. They're very easy to disguise. If you want to talk about not looking at the payload of messages, then what do you do about the PDF that's embedded in someone's email that contains an attack? What about the, Im the embedded image that has just a couple of lines of code inside a legitimate image, but when somebody views the image, it crashes their computer and makes a connection to an external hostile actor. It's, there's a technical response that's needed as well as a, a socio-political response um, and, and legal. And that's where it's, 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 it's very tough. Zero day attacks are very difficult to spot, very difficult to defend against, and unfortunately with the things like um, the ability to purchase uh, exploits on the market, very real problem. What's the going rate for an exploit right now? Good one. Uh, it depends. Um, usually the, the, the price is kind of a sliding scale based on the effectiveness, uh, availability of the, oper of the target. So as an example, um, I think uh, Android and simple browser exploits go for between thirty to $50,000. Um, but I heard a price thrown around for an iOS exploit, which was half a million dollars. It's all about the econo economics then. So I, everything comes back to economics. John, you were nodding. Did you want to jump in? Uh, yes, I agree with Mark's uh, uh, answer uh, to the extent he was saying that it's going to be very difficult to draw lines between uh, actors that are permitted to engage in uh, very uh, aggressive self-help <laughs> and those that are not. And I think that the low-hanging fruit here is much stronger information sharing uh, programs uh, and collaboration among private sector. We're seeing that. I think it was already referenced, uh, but to elaborate a bit, in the President uh, Obama's uh, executive order on mm -hmm. February 12th, right, expanding a uh, program that's going to be run out of the Department of Homeland Security, the Enhanced Cyber uh, Security Services program, right, whereby the government will provide uh, threat data, even highly sensitive threat data, to a limited number of qualified um, trusted companies, right? And those companies, in turn, will sup use that to supplement their own cybersecurity services and then offer that as a commercial service to uh, critical infrastructure and other entities that can't afford to do this all by themselves, right, who, who, need, who need some help. Raytheon's participating in that. Um, so I think th that is a, a much more promising, uh, at least in the short term, uh, avenue for addressing the problem. Well, let me, let me, did you want to say? Go, of course. go. Because I wanted to push back on that a bit, but go ahead. Okay. Uh, so, so I completely agree with what they both said. Um, so I, I think if you, it's very hard to actually 
do these things, right? Uh, there are very few companies that, uh, in this country that have the internal talent necessary to do this kind of intelligence gathering and response. So I do think there'll be some natural self-selection. But if you if you sort of force me to say how do we how do we control this? There are ways to do it. The, the problem is the solution may be worse than the cure, right? So I was going to mention the exact same thing John said. So there are sets of companies that have been selected by the government to provide services for critical infrastructure by the Department of Homeland Security. And they're called commercial service providers, CSPs. You could certainly expand that pool of companies. And so you now have a blessed list of companies that provide certain sets of services. Right now, those services are focused on taking this government threat information and using it to help uh, prevent malware from hitting a company, but you could expand the program, and these companies could start providing incident response services or all kinds of other services that the government could bless. So you could actually just create a list. Uh, there's other options. You could actually use a licensing scheme. And there's actually a paper in uh, Harvard Law Review from, I think, 98, uh, where a couple of people who are on the president's commission actually talked about creating a licensing scheme. So one can come up with ideas for ways to create standards of behavior and all that. The problem is they all have very large downside, and you know the, all those things would have to be weighed uh, to see if, if, if there's a benefit to not letting the market figure it out. Okay, that was going to be my question, which is what we, we license private investigators, we license um, private bounty hunters in the international sphere, we license privateers, we used to license privateers to go chasing after bad guys. You know, there's, there's a robust rule for, a robust set of rules about government license. We could even ask Dr. Ture to pull together a bunch of international experts and have him begin an international licensure um, system for, for uh, counteroffensives. If, we, if you want to add to your, your uh, portfolio uh, at the ITU. Um, but uh, with that, uh, are there questions? I, I've got plenty, but this is really for you guys. There's one, I see one over here in the corner. Uh, as much as anything, we've got about a... Jim, you want to end at like uh, 1345, right? So that we have a 15-minute break before the 2 o'clock? Yep. Go. I haven't heard uh, any talk about like um, per, the... Uh, what's that? Like, uh, McGuffey, the security we purchased uh, for our computer. I'm just wondering how much role they have gathered, I mean, as far as like uh, blocking some hackers of Spain and things like that, because I don't think they share that kind of information with us. So anybody want to talk to the role of McAfee and other antivirus programs in this in this space? Could you repeat the question as best you understood it? Yeah, uh, uh, she, she, she was asking about the role of McAfee uh, in providing for uh, cybersecurity. They don't, yeah, she was uh, suggesting that they don't share information with consumers that readily? Am, am I saying that right? Yeah. And uh, perhaps they should be obliged to share more? Uh, maybe that's an in, implicit in the question. I, I guess that depends on what information you want shared. Um, companies like McAfee are, are sharing out information like virus definitions that help you detect malware pretty much as quickly as they, as they find it because it's in their best interest to make their product as powerful as possible and detect as much as possible. There are other things potentially they could share, the other bits of data that they harvest. Um, and, and some of the companies already are. My company, Lookout, we are actually sharing the information that we collect from the mobile sphere. So information we gather on how applications behave, which applications misbehave, how certain devices behave, we are already sharing that. I'm not sure if sharing it with consumers is the right approach because I don't know the average consumer would know what to do with it but we are sharing with people like the operators and we're sharing with ISPs and big organizations to help empower them in, in dealing with the threats by using that kind of intelligence. And that is a growing industry. There's a lot of companies looking to leverage the kind of giant data sets that they're harvesting from their products and from their analysis and push that out to make people stronger. Down here in the front. While the mic is coming, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in that um, I'm not in a position to comment on McAfee specifically, but I think one of the one of the obstacles that private companies sometimes have to sharing uh, is they feel like, ooh, this is good threat data. I want to make money off my threat data, right? And I think for the open, fast uh, threat sharing, threat indicator sharing scenario and uh, solution or partial solution that I'm offering. 
we'd have to get away from that, right? We'd have to figure out some way to de demonetize the threat data and instead let companies uh, make their profit on uh, the value-added services they provide with that threat data, uh, perhaps putting that threat data in context, the speed with which it's, it's provided, the accuracy of it. Uh, but if, if everyone who gets word about something, uh, some threat data, thinks that's valuable, right? They're going to think it's proprietary and it's going to uh, make it difficult to do, difficult to have the incentive to share the way al along the ways, along the lines I suggested previously. I had a question. So uh, looking at the, the parallels of the private military corporations, so, you know, obviously engaging, here's a, here's a commercial entity that's engaging in, in, in some cases, offensive uh, military operations outside of the traditional rule of law uh, or, you know, clearly defined moral codes of, of, uh, of nation states acting in, in combat operations. So do you see parallels in terms of how this dialogue is, is, is advancing in terms of, you know, obviously a decade ago we wouldn't have thought of seeing, you know, a private enterprise engaging in uh, combat operations, you know, and creating problems obviously for militaries for actually nation states in the same theater of operations. So is there, you know, what are, what are the overlaps or parallels you see there in terms of the progression of law and, uh, and uh, activities? Yeah, uh, so a couple thoughts on that. Uh, the first is um, there is actually an exception uh, really in saying that the, the telemanual doesn't apply to what we're talking about, and that's if someone uh, enters the battlefield as a combatant, they, are, they become a legitimate target. Um, so if you have a private sector company that takes uh, action that's the equivalent of what a government would do in using force, they become a legitimate target. So, um, so in that sense, uh, you know, companies have to be careful, and I can tell you the U.S. government does not want companies doing that. Um, in fact, I mean, even within the U.S. government, there's, there's you know, very uh, clear boundaries in terms of Title 10 authority, Title 50 authority, all the authorities about who can actually take military action. So, um, so companies have to be careful that they don't want to get into taking actions that are viewed as being use of force because they become legitimate targets for reprisal by uh, another nation state. If, if you look at what's going on with military contractors, they're, they're similar. It, it gets a little tricky, but again, they're not, they're, they're entering, the, uh, potentially entering the battlefield in a certain role, but they're not authorized to use force on the behalf of the U.S. government. Um, it's, they're generally providing defensive uh, capabilities and supporting roles, but by entering the battlefield, they become legitimate targets. Uh, so that's a choice they've they've made as a as a company that that's a you know something they're willing to do, but they're not given the authority to uh, take certain actions that are limited to, to to the U.S. military. So I think I you know I'm not exactly how this would play out in cyberspace, but there's a huge body of law on on all this that I'm sure the other folks could could talk about. I don't think companies taking some form of militant action is a new thing, though. To be honest. Um, there's been industrial espionage as long as there's been industry. So companies have this kind of behavior, and when you bring up the analogy of privateers, let's not also forget what the privateers became. Many privateers became the pirates that other privateers chased down. And there's a real risk of, if you put too much power in certain companies' hands, how can you trust that that company is gonna work to the greater good or to their good? So I, I will go to you and Howard, no, you're next, but uh, there's actually a, another piece of this, which I think goes back even further, which is we have a very long history of mercenary behavior, right? And the real difference in all of this is what the command and control structure looks like. Mercenaries are under military command, paid, right, as opposed to volunteer armies or draftees, but, um, but paid for their services and services available to the highest bidder. The, what we're contemplating here um, is private action that looks a lot like that, but is outside the command and control structure of the United States or, or any other government. And there's an interesting um, question whether or not the best answer to all of this is to, uh, I was asked on the first panel about militarizing cyberspace. Um, a flip of it might be privatizing the military response. Yeah, pulling it the other way, which would be very interesting and most of the companies don't want to be there, right? You know, they don't like that idea. Yeah, thanks, Paul. And, and, and this is absolutely wonderful panel, but I have a question. And, and Irv, you just mentioned about entering the field of combat. You become an enemy combatant. Some nations, and, and, and even discussions within, within the United States, are 
from time to time classify hacktivists, which you know, our society and some of the social improvements we've had have baked on activists, you know, blocking streets and protesting and, and, and a whole litany of things like that. But some of them are now being viewed as almost as terrorists uh, because of some of the activities that are taking place. Irv, you, you brought it up, and I guess this is directed at you, but I'm happy to get the, the thoughts from the rest of the panel. H how do we look at that from a nation state perspective when people exercising the things that we hold dear, such as freedom of expression, can now be branded as a terrorism because a terrorist because it's taking place on the internet. Thanks. Yeah, so th that's a great question. Um, and in fact, I mean, this gets to uh, an interesting uh, issue that Dr. Touré talked about yesterday uh, from Wicket, which is, you know, even defining cybersecurity and whether that includes things that might destabilize a regime. Um, there's actually uh, some discussion uh, in the Talon Manual uh, about that question uh, and proxies. And uh, I, I'm really, I really start to get out of my depth here. I'm not a lawyer, but a, you know, there's a, a, a precedent set, I think the Caroline incident, Caroline. That, that where you know, there's been international law on this question of basically at what point, uh, and also the, uh, you know, like from, from the mining of harbors and things like that, uh, that the United States conducted, right? This question of uh, how, at what point does government support of, a, of an activity uh, you know, cross the line into use of force. So if you provide funding, does that cross the line? If you provide training, does the, and it turns out the line is actually pretty far. In other words, just providing funding and training is not enough to cross the line. You actually have to, uh, I think, provide, take action, provide orders. Uh, there has to be some command and control there. So on the cyber side, what this means is in theory, a country could fund and potentially even train hackers. And if that's all they do, and maybe say, hint, hint, you know, gosh, we'd love for you to, you know, do some things, and, but they don't actually tell them what to do or give them command and control, they haven't actually crossed that line and we can't hold the government responsible, which is really interesting. At least through the law of armed conflict, you can obviously, hold, you know, as a, poli a matter of policy, hold them responsible. Mm -hmm. um, but so, um, it, it'd be, again, it'd be great to hear what other people have to say, but it's really interesting. So that means it's actually really hard to hold countries responsible even if they're sponsoring cyber activity that could be causing us great harm if they don't cross that line. I'll repeat it. How we're saying the flip ah. side is where nation where nations label label free speech act, act, activists as terrorists, and you know, there's a, I, I'm going to put this. That's a great question, and I'm going to put it in in terms that everybody in the room will understand. Um, a year and a half ago. Uh, the internet went dark for a day, pretty much. Uh, Wiki, Wiki, uh, Wikipedia shut down. Google had the big black uh, square on it. And it was in protest uh, of legislation that Congress was considering called SOAP and PIPA that the big internet service providers didn't like. And we, that was great, right? This, that was free speech at its best and people not um, uh, uh, you know, expressing themselves through, through, the, through the thing. If, a bunch of Iranians had did that to Google, to Google or WikiLeaks or Wikipedia. Yeah, uh, we'd have called them terrorists. And yet, the overall effect on the ability of uh, the American citizen outside of that to use that was precisely the same. And uh, yeah. Lots of cases where you're right. Oh no! So oh, of course no. So the point is, the point is, the point is, you can't um, base it on an effects test. You're going to have to get to a point where you uh, use an intent test, and then you have to either say, our measure of intent is the only one that we accept, where we're America, and you know, free speech good, uh, you know, uh, uh, terrorist actions bad, and we know the difference, we make the rules, or we're going to have to abide an international system where you know, there are going to be other actors who are going to have a different view on, on, on which intents are good and which are bad. I was actually making the point. Much closer with pick It's very from pure speech acts to violent activity. That's right. That's exactly right. Other questions or anybody else on the panel? No? I don't think so. It, it's actually a, a really difficult proposition because we don't want to suppress free speech, but at the same time, we don't want to allow people to slip through the net. I'd say the, the appropriate response is to make sure that the law is proportional and some common sense is applied. If somebody is, is performing the equivalent of 
digital graffiti, then should that solicit a military response? Definitely not. And I think if you look across the board and, and think with some common sense, then maybe there's some guidelines there that can help shape it. Well, that's always going to get back to, uh, in all of our responses, we have overarching obligations of proportionality. Even if somebody uses force at you by shooting a BB gun at you, it is impermissible to launch a nuclear weapon in response, right? But the, so, but the problem is, we're, with the ineffectiveness of policing some of this crime, the laws that have been drafted as a response are, are overly all, broad. Are, are, are all nuclear weapons. Yeah. Sir, I'll jump, yeah. I'll jump oh, in. Yeah, sorry. One more comment. I, I think, Howard, you know, you've put your finger on uh, a, a critical distinction, right? That this is so challenging, and I think this is why coming up with an effective international public agreement, a public treaty, will be so difficult, because we're talking about nations that have antipodal concepts of what the Internet is for <laughs> and what, what good it does, right? You have U.S. society, right, which is open, we think inter uh, information ought to be free, right, very open society, and then you've got China, which is arguably the most information controlling government ever, right, um, in, in terms of how much it's uh, has to control and, and wants to control I information. So I think it's going to be very difficult through treaty to find a way for uh, for all the countries that matter <laughs> to, to find uh, to get consensus. Ever? You mean like Nazi Germany, you know, Stalin Russia? Yeah. It, it's an information control. Uh, I, I, I mean, there's just so much more information now True. through control just, in that sense. You're right. Yeah. yeah, this gentleman has it, and then Mike. Yeah. I, would, I would like to extend the question from Howard. And I think our vision is that we um, will have a global village internet. And, um, and we see that different countries have different law. And we have to understand that this law reflects different cultures. And um, I'm a German, and uh, of course, in Germany, we have a different idea of, uh, about data protection and privacy. privacy. And uh, so my question is, how can we develop an international common internet culture? Mark? <laughs> Mark? <laughs> you're, you're, you're Mr. Culture. <laughs> that's, that's really, really difficult. Um, Everybody has their own agenda, and getting people to cooperate in that sense, I, 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 I hate to suggest that we need an internet version of NATO, but perhaps that's the answer, to pull together an organization to help deal with it. Other than that, voluntary cooperation between everyone, I honestly can't see it happening. There, there are countries out there who don't see half of what's going on as a crime, and other com countries that have so much to profit from these things that are happening that they don't care it's a crime. It's difficult, but there, I think there is some option to persuade some countries. If you look at China as an example, it's very clear that China is desperate to have a Silicon Revolution. They're doing everything they can to kindle some of the new media benefits that we've seen in the Western world. They've opened up things like GitHub, they, open up things like Wikipedia, and it's becoming quite piecemeal in terms of what you can and cannot access through the Great Firewall. I think there's opportunity to persuade countries like that, because you can offer them the benefits, and by pulling together some treaties and agreements, that's leverage to get some of these in place. But this is, um, this is a difficult proposition. And, and Germany in particular, I um, have some personal experience of some of the challenges there. Even launching a, a benign uh, antivirus service in Germany proved to be very difficult because the concept of intercepting traffic as it went over the wire to scan it for viruses rather than at an endpoint caused all sorts of difficulties. It's, yeah, challenging. Anybody else? Yeah, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> difficult question. It's very difficult, yeah. Um, but just to throw out some, some thoughts of things that, that could be done, I, I, I think there might be a way uh, to make some progress. So first is you can get groups of like-minded nations together. Um, so 
they have you know, some areas of common interest, and there might be some issues where there's universal agreement. So for example, child pornography is an obvious one. There might be a few others. You know, botnets are generally bad. It's hard to think of lots of good uses for, for botnets. Um, and uh, there might be a few other areas. So, so you might be able to get like-minded nations to agree on a few common principles and, and basically build out. So you start slowly um, with things that everyone can agree on and, or, or most people can agree on, and then you start maybe expanding out. And then at the end of the day, you know, there's always gonna be differences and that's perfectly legitimate. But um, you know, I do think that, that moving forward in that way, rather than trying to get um, you know, everyone together on the same page at once on a lot of these issues, uh, it might be a bit of a challenge. Now there are, you know, Dr. Torre is, trying, is, is doing some good work with the ITU at, at, at working across that global sphere on some issues like infrastructure and things like that. But in terms of some of the specific cybersecurity areas, it might be better to start smaller and then build out. I, I actually wonder if, if having that dream is not a barrier to success in a lot of ways. I mean, the, 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 the domain is as broad as the globe. Yeah. And in no other domain would we aspire to uh, a universal uh, application that, that had real teeth. We, I mean, and, and when we do aspire to it, we fail universally. We can't address global climate change. We can't, I mean, you, you can just list the areas in which we have failed um, because of diver I mean, not for bad reasons, but for the, so, you know, maybe I, I tend to think with Irv that say, setting that as your, as your goal uh, is, is so ambitious that you don't even start the project. I completely agree. <laughs> You got the you got the mic. Okay. Well, uh, a couple of things. First of all, I uh, I think I, I'm going to respond to a question that was asked after I got the mic because I think it's after or I think it's relevant. Uh, the uh, I think actually there is a, a, a forming international culture with regard to what the norms are ought to be on, on on the internet, and I think that the SOPA PIPA blackout, which was not really something I think that's very easily interpreted. Uh, in any context done by anyone as, as a kind of a terrorist action uh, is an example because what you saw in the SOPA PIPA blackout were uh, people acting independently uh, but with the authority to act on the systems that they were blocking. So Wikipedia and the people who participated in the Wikipedia blackout clearly had the authority to do it but a lot of those people who participated in implementing that were international, uh, were people in other countries who nevertheless had the authority uh, to black out Wikipedia, and the same is true for other entities, including uh, people uh, in other countries who blacked out their websites in uh, sympathy with the SOPA PIPA blackout. So this was something that actually represents, in my mind, uh, some commonality of values in different parts of the international internet using community. Uh, the second thing I thought was worth uh, pointing out was uh, that I, I, I know that we've been here for a while when Paul, uh, you know, as I said, I'm Mike Godwin from Internews, so whenever Paul uh, or anyone wants to bring up Nazi Germany and compare it to anything, I'm naturally happy to ask for the mic. Uh, but having said that, I, I think that the fact is we, we uh, are often uh, confronted with the uh, with, uh, uh, observation that maybe we should just throw up our hands, that maybe international cooperation uh, in this context is impossible, but in my view, and as someone who's worked in the space for a, a pretty long time, what I think is amazing about internet and internet services is how high a degree of international cooperation we in fact have. It's just astonishing. Uh, whether you're talking about particular projects like Wikipedia, which turn out to be valuable uh, in, a, in a fairly counterintuitive way, given how it functions, to the internet standards themselves, we actually do have uh, something that I think is very uh, hope-inspiring going on in terms of uh, the immense amounts of cooperation that make the Internet function to the degree, degree that it does. And you can comment on that if you like. Go ahead, Derp. Yeah, quick comment. Yeah, I think th that's a great point. So, so in my experience, uh, you're exactly right. There's a tremendous amount of cooperation, but at the informal level. So within uh, you know, different groups, right? So the folks who run the internet infrastructure, they all know each other, they all work together, the security folks. I think the problem you get into is when you get bump up to the nation state level and then you're dealing with politics and 
uh, local politics, international politics, whatever, and I think that's where the, the challenge is greatest. So you, you make an excellent point, and, and thank God we have that, that cooperation, and that people can put that aside uh, to keep the internet functioning and help secure it and make sure the infrastructure works. Um, so I guess the question is, how do you balance you know, the informal networks with the formal state level stuff? I think that's a that's a fair expression of the of the fear. Um, I guess I'm just not nearly as sanguine as you are. Um, be, uh, what I, the trend I see is that um, sovereign nations, whether we will it or not, are going to assert control over the networks and are going to um, uh, attempt to take a role. And if it's done the right way, that'll be good. If it's done the blunt way. Um, you know, I've, I always had the suspicion that if something like uh, the Sopa Pippa blackout had happened in Belarus, all the owners of the networks would have ended with, you know, jail manacles on their on their arms, if not worse. So, it, it, it's not necessarily going to be a success, a uniform success of the group. But I hope you're right. I'd rather you were, Dr. Ture, I think you get the last question for the for the for this uh, panel. Yeah, thank you very much. It's a comment actually because uh, ITU was uh, named for internet governance, and we just wanted to make sure that uh, I, may, I correct that statement because uh, it's no nowhere in my job description as Secretary General of the Union. Uh, I was uh, I had my roadmap cut out for me by the member states in 2010 when I was re-elected for the next four years and there's nowhere internet governance in there, and it cannot put anything new in it there, and we don't need it, and I said it yesterday. So uh, I, I just wanna make sure that, but our community is equally contributing in the, in the overall uh, model of the multi-stakeholder uh, governance of the, of the internet as, you, as anybody else, as any stakeholder, uh, but that should not be seen as a, 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 an attempt for control but of course, you will always see a frustrated country uh, for uh, frustrated by the control of another country saying that it should be taken out of uh, the hand of any country and given to the international community. You will have those kind of complaints uh, on a regular basis, and we do see them. And during, in December uh, in Dubai, we have seen uh, attempts of this nature and actually people have seen me doing the right thing in making sure that uh, we were not gonna be derailed in the discussion in toward that. So, and I've been very clear, specific on this. So I just wanted to make that correction so that uh, we don't leave here with uh, the impression that uh, there will be an attempt from, uh, for ITU to, to take over the, or even participate in the governance of the internet. What we do is complementary to the overall internet which is the provision of broadband connectivity. And our constituency is very well, well organized and uh, uh, well regulated for that. And, uh, but of course, the internet community does not see any regulation. We have a regulation in our, our industry, it's working well. There's no regulation in the internet uh, community. It's working well too, and the two have been working together. So there's nothing contradictory over there. So I, I just wanted to make that clear. Of course, this is a very good uh, introduction to the next uh, panel. Uh, panel that will be, uh, I've been taking some notes here and I, uh, that I have a number of comments that I, would, I wanted to make as well, but I will have that opportunity in the next panel. So please don't go. Thank don't you. Go. So um, as we get to the close of the panel, I think I can summarize it um, this way. Uh, if we are contemplating the prospect of private sector action in cyberspace, in self-defense, or in active offense. Um, it is, in some sense, almost certainly inevitable, since private sector actors are going to protect their own property and going to make a risk value judgment about whether or not what they're doing uh, is, uh, how much they're going to lose by not doing it or by doing it, and some will make the judgment to do it. It is uh, assuredly 
uh, uh, problematic for sovereign nations when private sector actors start taking actions across borders. Um, uh, the foundation of the Westphalian state is the idea of sovereign control of cross-border uh, activity, and we are breaking that paradigm down right now. And, uh, and that, that, that is posing a challenge that was very nicely captured in the, in the last set of exchanges. Um, and then, and so the third thing is that that means that though there is no real clear international doctrine on this right now, there's almost certainly going to be in the future uh, because we can't abide a future in which all this cross-border activity is a free fire zone without any rules at all. Um, because that way lies chaos. What those rules are going to be, your guess is as good as mine, but at least we've opened up the topic to discussion. So with that, please join me in thanking our panel, Irving, Mark, and John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.